Hello, everybody. Welcome to Founders and Creators. Today on our show, we have Nick, aka Found and Explained. He is a YouTube creator who creates videos about all things planes. His channel, Found and Explained, has a quarter of a million subscribers and a massive 55 million channel views. Nick, welcome to the show. How's it going today? Very good. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here and be on uh, your show. I've watched all of your episodes, so I'm. it's like a place of honor to be finally called up to be here with such illustrious alumni. <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind. <laughs> yeah, we've had some pretty cool guests so far. Um, I was really excited to get you on just because you have such a unique channel. So let's get into that. So how did you get started on YouTube? Well, it's absolutely fascinating because I was actually making videos for another channel that's quite popular on YouTube at the moment. And I didn't understand any of sort of the business side behind YouTube. I thought that only the, the very best of the best, the big media companies could actually uh, create videos um, uh, uh, you know, create videos on YouTube and be financially successful. And then the channel that I was working for actually revealed to me their financial statements. And I realized that I was doing the producing, the script writing. I was the voice. I was the brand of the channel. Like people saw my face and they recognized me and they went like, I want to tune into this channel to watch Nick. Little did they know that I was actually getting paid like probably less than you would get someone on Upwork. Like I was doing like an internship level sort of pay. And so I decided to go out on my own and say, I'm going to give this YouTube a crack. Like if it really is quite possible for anybody to make it on YouTube, maybe I can make it too. And here we are today. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's a, such a neat story. Wow. Especially since, you know, you started working on someone else's channel or someone else's brand. And then you kind of were like, Hey, I might as well do it myself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So in the beginning, I, I wanted to talk about the beginning, all right? You made videos about football, immune rescue, a bunch of other interesting topics. What made you decide to niche down on planes? Well, it's so funny because you mentioned those videos. Those are actually some of my favorite videos, the ones that are so like crazy out there because I really thought at the beginning that I had to really find something that nobody had ever heard of, that it had to be like, did you know that in Tasmania off the coast of Australia, there is a type of rock that when exposed to sunlight, blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's nothing that people are actually searching for like it might be a fascinating topic but it's not something that people are actually like looking for right. and so basically i started to do uh plane designs i was always interested in doing um aircraft concepts doing um sort of never built aircraft crazy stuff from like the cold war where they had way too much money and probably a little bit too much of that uh, sort of lsd and stuff <laughs> uh, where uh, and i thought that it would also tune into aviation journalism because that's what I was also doing at the time. I was an aviation journalist. So it seemed sort of like a natural fit. And um, aviation is one of those niches where it's got a lot of people who are interested in searching for it. And also there's a lot of current events and news always happening. So uh, niching down onto planes was sort of a natural step from my videos it was the probably the only videos on my channel that did well and um despite the other ones being very cool uh planes was sort of the way forward for me to do this full time that's awesome that's really cool so so then uh, you kind of answered the question already but you know were you always in the planes like growing up or was there some sort of story there oh it's 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 actually more interesting than you think i knew nothing about planes about four years ago Really? Like, I, I really want to make this out that I'm not some, like, savant who's been <laughs> piloting 747 since I was five years old. I have nobody in my family who's into planes. Basically, I love to travel, and I was always flying around, and I was looking for freelance work, and I found, like, travel blogs. Travel blogs will pay you money to, at least back then when we could travel around the world at a moment's notice, they would pay you money for flight reviews, for reviews of hotels and things. You've just got to be able to be a writer and take some photos, maybe put together a little video. And so I started doing um, articles and talking about aircraft and it was so bad. 
it was so bad. I was making mistakes, like factual mistakes, not like grammatical, but like yeah. mistakes about aircraft that are embarrassing today. I'd be like, so I flew on the Concorde today. And people would be like, the Concorde hasn't existed like for <laughs> decades now. You know, I'm flying on board the Emirates plane in like to Tennessee. And they're like, that's not even an Emirates. It's not even a, it's an Airbus plane. Like what's wrong with you? Because I was so new, but I had the very fortunate position to be uh, continuously employed by that company that was mm -hmm. paying me for the articles. And I became an aviation journalist through them. And it was some of the best time of my life flying around doing reviews and, and writing articles. And they, um, th that allowed me to become much more knowledgeable so if anybody wants to become like an expert it's kind of like that ten thousand hours thing to become an expert i did uh two thousand articles on this website and if each article took about one to two hours to do you can see i've done about four hours four thousand hours of research wow. into aircraft and that's how i got into planes and so it's like <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not like it's it's something that i was born with to to put that bluntly right okay no that's that's super interesting it's funny because you know we had we had dean on here and it was kind of like the opposite with him like he you know I, well, well kind of the opposite he wasn't interested in music and then he got interested in music uh just because he found this old guitar i believe it was at his like, grandparents house and then after that he just like grinded into music for like years and years and then it's just it's, it's hilarious how these like things kind of find their way into our life mm -hmm. uh, especially with our interests so while we're on the topic of that, I know a lot of people struggle with finding their niche. Could you offer some advice for people trying to find their niche? Oh, definitely. And I think that my advice is going to be probably very different from anybody else's advice, maybe. And basically, it's this. If you're going to find a niche, it's all about finding one that is actually going to be successful. It's not about choosing a niche that, say, is a popular thing or something like that. Basically, I have sort of three rules to choose a niche. The first one is that it has to have lots of news, lots of updates. There is a mutual friend of ours that we both know who does a video game and he does fantastic content on this video game however this video game gets rarely zero updates occasionally might get a sequel and has a diminishing player base over time so you get people all the time who go i am the best person in this niche about this video game but it's dead and it's like, nothing's going to happen with this game. So you've got to choose a niche that has continuous news. And say, for example, aviation, uh, racing, sports, all these things have tons of news. If you're looking for the best news niche topic, it's actually celebrity news because it's super popular and it's constantly um changing and that actually leads into the second thing it's got to be popular it has to be a niche that has like a lot of stuff and when you go onto youtube if you're constantly coming across it and you might be thinking say minecraft minecraft it's too hard there's too many people in that niche but that's the complete opposite that means there's a market and so you can actually go into minecraft or say aviation and you can just make videos in that niche and there's already an audience ready and looking for your topics now, the third one is the thing that people don't really talk about, and I think it's the most important, and you can kind of see my perspective when it comes to YouTube. The niche needs to be valuable. A lot of people get into memes. A lot of people get into children's cartoons, and it's not valuable because the audience watching doesn't have money to spend. Now, out there, there is a very good list that I can give to you for a, a future video, perhaps, where it explains the various niches and how valuable the top one is to the very bottom one. But basically, you're looking for niches that either have um, a lot of people willing to buy, like women and makeup. Like if you're doing uh, women's fashion or something like that, then people will be like, um, oh, I'm, I'm ready to buy it. That's why shop haul videos do so well and makeup review videos. Or alternatively, if you do something to do with uh, old men, people who perhaps fly a lot or something like that. <laughs> people that, uh, uh, I mean, it was a coincidence that I happened to choose aviation and that there is a very marketable audience of older gentlemen for it. But, and then the last one I would say would be like financial 
example, if you're doing topics that are to do with making money, then people are always going to be gravitating towards you. So you need something that is constantly updating with a lot of people watching and has a profitable niche. And those should be your three rules before you settle in a niche. Fantastic. Well, wow. you you are thorough. <laughs> if I could rate that answer, I'd give I'd give you an A plus because thank uh, you. I, <laughs> I think a lot That's of people, the only A plus I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people that's a big struggle for them finding, you know, what they want to do, whether it be on YouTube or just regular content generation is, you know, where to go, what direction. But I think you put it in a fantastic perspective. So I think we'll just, you know, leave it at that because that was again. A plus answer there. <laughs> so to shift gears a little bit, a lot of your videos feature really historical elements. Now I know you mentioned the planes thing. You that was more of a learned thing. Uh, was histor or history or historical stuff was that learned, or did you always have an interest in that as well? I will say that I always had an interest in history, but it only happened after school i think school is the kind of the worst place in the world to learn history because you're not allowed to explore like either at your own pace or go down those little rabbit holes mm -hmm. i am a sucker for a good uh wikipedia binge oh, yeah. where you just keep clicking the links and it's like but his brother actually worked on the submarine and so you keep going down like all these little rabbit holes and so for me history was also always so uh fascinating because it's like real life stories. Like I love a good science fiction movie. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but like a real life history is just so much more fascinating. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree. I love history. I'm, I'm big into it. I, <laughs> I've, I enjoyed it in school, but I was kind of like, I'm kind of the same way. It's like visiting places. Like uh, I took a trip to Gettysburg, which is a, a, a big, battle during the civil war and and i was like mm -hmm. super interested in it because i was like there i was like i was walking amongst you know where, where the soldiers fought and stuff like that i just think that's so so interesting so then what does your research process look like because i noticed a lot of your videos feature you know world war ii planes i, I, I saw the one you did on um the nazi plane and then i also saw the train one that you did which i saw you were like shifting gears a little bit um so so what does your research process look like well, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly comment on the Nazi train video. That that video really blew up far more than I ever possibly imagined. I think it's like approaching 3 million views now, which is just ridiculous for a channel that's about planes. <laughs> so basically, you can see that uh, uh, the lesson is there always be trying something new. Like YouTube, very fortunately, I'm at the level where it's a platform for me to try new things. And I think I think that's something you always need to do is try to evolve your channel, but kind of tie it back in, um, example, into the history aspect. And so for my process, when it comes to sitting down and creating these videos, it does start with sort of the research. Uh, generally, it's sort of an inkling an idea, or perhaps one of my Patreons will suggest an idea. That's one of the perks that they get is that they can suggest an idea. And then we start to look at it. We start to see if there's a story there. And then once we've seen that there's a story there, we've read a bit about it it's actually this is going to sound like again the complete opposite advice of what you think i do i actually go to wikipedia and i use the i, I read the wikipedia and i go like well there's the structure because it, it, stories in history have a timeline and so we use that timeline we just try to figure out like okay well the engineers needed to solve this problem and then they came up with this design to solve it. And this is what happened to the design. And generally with all of my creations that are never built, it's always fascinating to talk about why it didn't happen. So I sit down, I like write out sort of a rough outline with the main bullet points, and then I just fill in the details. And most of the time I do have to go to the original sources from there to find out the details. Like, oh, I need to know how many crew members sat on board. So I need to look at the original blueprints wow. and such like that. Wow, that's really cool. So I, I, I'm, I'm like the same way. I think Wikipedia gets a bad rep but there's actually a lot of great ways that you can use Wikipedia as a tool. Because like, if you go to the bottom, I'm sure, you know, there's the sources down there. And if you just click on the sources, like that's legitimate. Uh, that's why I, I use, me too. I use Wikipedia. I was even using it in school. I remember the professors would go nuts. I never used yeah. it. I would, I would never use it as like a, a reference, 
but I'd go to Wikipedia, I'd, I'd read, and then I'd go down, I see where the reference was, I click the, the resource, and then I take it from there. Yeah, it's like, it's a no brainer, but it's just sitting there here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And But you see, most of the time, Wikipedia is actually sort of the highlight reel. And if you click on the sources down below, you actually find out like so much more detail about projects and history and events that actually make it a fascinating video. And a lot of the comments I get are people going like, how come I've never heard of this? Like, you, like, where is this coming from? And it's like, if you just go to the Wikipedia, to the sources, click on it, and then read the original author's book. I have bought a few books here. I've got them back behind me here of the original copies of things. Cool. Um, it, it, you can actually see that it's just like, it, it's there. Wow. No, I, I, I totally agree. That's, that's, that's funny how you do that. But, you know, it makes sense. So to shift gears a little bit, you just hit a massive milestone. You hit a quarter of a million subscribers. Uh, that's that's freaking huge. What is the biggest difference for you as a content creator now that you've surp surpassed that number? Oh, wow. That's a fascinating question. Um, it's definitely been a huge milestone to reach this, but it's been kind of crazy how fast the growth has been going because I feel like that I just got my... One second, I'll just show you something. Sure. <laughs> it feels like just yesterday that oh, i got nice this. there you go yeah and so there it is the founding explain that's a hundred thousand uh, subscriber plaque that we get on our wall it's fantastic um it just feels like yesterday i got that and now i'm at two hundred and fifty thousand. and wow. i think probably by the time uh you viewers at home who are watching this <laughs> i might be a little bit higher um <laughs> but anyway it's uh it is uh, an interesting interesting thing to see how things change and i think uh, something that you may have come across before is the positivity at the beginning it's surprisingly quite negative the comments if you're a beginner and you've got under a thousand subscribers i'd say even under ten thousand subscribers a lot of your comments are going to be from people who don't know anything but have all the opinions in the world about why you suck and it was disheartening to read that all the time, to uh, make spend ages writing a video and then having people go, oh, this is terrible. But then you reach a point where you get over 10,000 subscribers and the comments generally just change to positive. And then it, it's like, there's so many positive people. There's so many people watching. There's so many people who keep coming back and again and say, oh, we really love your channel that, uh, Anybody who had criticisms kind of gets washed out. I personally do try to keep up with a lot of the comments, but I would suggest that for anybody who gets to uh, over 10,000 uh, subscribers, not to worry about the comments. Like they are important to keep a pulse on your community, but don't worry about trying to reply to everybody and don't take everybody to heart because what you're doing is working and any advice that someone gives you, most of the time they don't even have a channel. And so I would say that the community is the big difference that changes once you get sort of to this level. Oh, wow. That's, that's a really unique perspective. And I, and I think that that's a good point too, because I mean, even I've noticed that with my main channel, you know, I'm, I think I'm at like 33,000 right now subscribers. And, you know, when you do a video and it's 99.8% likes and you get a majority of these comments that are, you know, really good. It, for some reason, us creators, we, we tend to look at those negative comments, but you can't, you can't, you just got to move past that because, you know, generally speaking, this is a good video. I mean, if, if a hundred thousand people watched it and they all thought it was good, you know, it's good. And you just should have faith yeah. in yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, to the people who hate my Nazi video, my Nazi train video is a very long list, but the 3 million other people that have watched it, they, they seem to like it. So <laughs> it's, it's like sort of a mind mindset shift. You really do need to step away and realize that um, most people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and if people are enjoying your content, if you put it up there and you're getting views and um, I I've always heard this phrase that it's something like one out of 10 comments is someone saying positive. Like it will be like nine, nine mean comments and one positive comment because positive people never comment. People never give positive feedback if they've enjoyed something. They'll just watch it and then they'll move on. But the negative people, they'll be like, you have to stop what you're doing and go back to your day job. So, right. <laughs> oh, 
That's interesting. So you've talked a few times about the team surrounding you and your channel. Could you explain how your team functions, why you chose to give up some of your responsibilities and how it helps you produce more content? Definitely, definitely. So for the longest time, my ego was like, oh no, I have to do everything. That I have to be one of those creators that's constantly like, you know, here and the center of camera. But I realized that, you know, there's no, there's no I in team. So uh, basically with a team, I'm able to create such better work and I couldn't do it without them. And that has been sort of a major change in the last sort of six months. I've probably started having a team for around about a year to six months ago. And I started to look at areas of what I was doing that wasn't necessarily the magic behind things because there's a lot of tasks when you sit okay say for example you're making a sandwich right and and bear with me this is going somewhere (laughs) say for example you're making a sandwich putting the bread in the toaster for this toast sandwich is not like the part of the sandwich that makes it delicious the ingredients is the part the the good part of the sandwich it's when you add the spice or something or when you plate it when you eat it that's the magic but these tasks of like going to the store buying the uh, peanut butter and jelly it's it's not (laughs) these parts are something that you can outsource and so that's when it comes to uh video production i looked at the what i was doing and i realized that I could be a lot more creative. I could make more videos if parts of my process were um, taken over by a more skilled person. And so that's like the second half of it is that I had to swallow my pride and realize I'm not that great at a lot of things. Everything from like 3D modeling, which I feature extensively in my videos, as even to editing. And I've been editing for years now. And so I looked at getting someone on board and that person um, who's called June, by the way, if you're watching, you're a great team member. Um, they have taken an important role in, in my channel and become sort of part of it. You know, it's their creativity that actually puts together the videos in such a way that the audience really enjoys. And so I think that a lot of people are afraid to uh, i think you touched on that. a lot of people are afraid to take a step back they feel like that the magic from their channel is going to go away and the advice for that is and it's something that i was taught before i started to give sections of my production away to other people to do was that will your audience notice a 10 percent drop in quality but you're doing a 100% drop in effort in that section. So take the edit, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be 100% no longer you doing the editing, but it's only going to drop 10% in quality. And will your audience even notice? So what I actually did is I, I was doing all the videos and then I said, okay, I'll do one video that I don't edit. And it was my best video in a long time wasn't the one that I edited. <laughs> so that was like a green light to me to be comfortable to give away parts of my production for other people to do. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to release something without sitting down and watching it. So you always have that final control anyway. Right. And I think that's something that a lot of people need to hear that it's okay because your audience is probably not going to notice, but they will notice an extra whole video you know, a month because you're now free to uh, work on that. You're now got free time and your quality of life. You know, you now have time to do things. Oh, that's a, that's a great point. And that's great feedback for someone who's in that position. So I guess that the, the minor follow-up question to that is, was there a particular moment that you had where you were like, Hey, I need to bring somebody on board or, Hey, I need to, you know, kind of get some help. Oh, definitely. Definitely. There was a point probably about a year ago where I was so tired. I was like, so burnt out. Like, sure, I can sit down and edit for hours. And at the beginning, when you make a channel, that is like the most exciting thing. You just want to stay at home, close the blinds, tell the girlfriend to like, not, you know, don't come in my room. So you can just grind away making tons of content. However, you can't do that forever. You're not a robot. And after a while, you start to get really tired. And that was me. I was starting to get really burnt out. I didn't feel like releasing a video. I think there was a point where I had a video reach a million views and it took me a month to bring out another video. 
Like you should be like striking whilst the iron is hot, but I was like too tired. So then I got like an editor on board who was able to uh, step in um, and sort of take over that production process. Then I could just focus on the script writing and making the actual 3D models and improving production in other areas. Because now I could split like that remaining time into uh, other areas and it actually really boosted my channel. That's awesome. No, that's 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 neat. And that's like I said, that's great feedback for anyone who's in that position. Um, so I, I did want to talk about your branding. I'm kind of like a branding nerd. Could you explain yeah, definitely. You came up with your name and logo? Because I, I really like both. Definitely. So um, basically, I started off, my channel was originally called Aviation Station when I started, and I was going to just do aviation topics. That, however, rubbed some people the wrong way who were currently employing me at the time because oh. it was a conflict of interest, kind of. You know, they were very nice in the way that they said that, but actually looking back now, it wasn't, wasn't probably the nicest thing. So then I had to sort of change the name rapidly and I came up with the idea of, um, you know, I find things and then I explain them. So I just called it Found and Explained. And that's like the origin of the channel. Um, in retrospect, it's a terrible name. If I was to recreate a name, I would choose something that was short, something that is very easy and like maybe based off a common project, like, uh, you know, you call the, the thing torch or something like that, <laughs> or like highlights or something like that. And also because there was already another channel called Explained, which mm -hmm. explains uh, movies and videos and they, they get so many views. So like every time you try to Google my channel name fortunately now it's a little bit easier because i have become a little bit bigger but at the beginning it would just it would just be lost you would not be able to find my channel via search um and i don't think a lot of people are even able to remember it today so if you have found this uh this video through searching on youtube search you've you've found kind of struck gold there <laughs> um yeah and so then it basically i had the worst logo and i'm going to give you the logo so you can see it and show it up on screen okay, i'll put for this right part here, here. <laughs> yeah uh, i had the worst logo you can obviously see that it's something that i created just rapidly using the same fonts as this like aviation station logo mm -hmm. and then i um hired a uh, graphic designer to be doing some graphics work like creating the blueprints in an animated way and he was just working and he was watching the channel to get an idea of like what the channel was and stuff and he went like you have a terrible logo <laughs> he was like he goes hundred dollars hundred us dollars and i will create all your branding and he made a whole branding guide for my That's channel awesome. and he he created it and and obviously it's it's clear to see today that he's actually very talented and i got a hell of a deal that you know and i have since hired him again for other work but like you can see that the branding came together really well and so the ampazam is actually the the channel logo and you know uh, the interesting thing is though with the found and explained mm -hmm. it's not clear if it's found like plus explained found ampersand explained or found <laughs> end explained and i've always kind of had that a bit vague because i've never really been sure like how to describe it uh which has led to some problems when it comes to signing contracts for stuff because um. the name's always kind of <laughs> A little bit shifting around yeah. but yeah so that's sort of the story behind the logo and the branding and oh and the colors are because of a sunset Aww. because we have like the clouds and the sunset because it was like an aviation channel and i chose i think it was a uh, it's like purple and a bit of orange or something because mm -hmm. i've always loved that sort of twilight uh colors that's so cool that the attention to detail that is that's top tier that's awesome i i really appreciate when brands or companies or, you know, creators like put the time into their stuff like that, because, you know, for a lot of people, they're just like, eh, this is a logo. I'll just throw it out there. But when there's story and there's effort, I think it can go a long way, especially like, you know, in your instance, clearly it's working out for you. So um, you definitely are skilled in rendering objects. I mean, we touched a little bit about this. You do planes, clouds, trains, more. If someone wanted to learn these skills, what would you recommend them to do? Yeah, so 3D is like 
as wide as a puddle, but as deep as an ocean. It's one of those things that I've had people come to me. I've had people, even on my own team, who have seen the effort that I have to do to make the 3D say, let me help. Let me just like, tell me what to do and I'll do the 3D for you. You know, it's something I can do. And I have to be like, no, no, you can't. Like, it's, it's like building a house. It's like, I could put up some wood and then put it around and it looks like a house, but you can't live in it. And so when it comes to 3D, I am completely self-taught. I didn't study it at university or anything like that. Apart from, I think, a one-off class once where I used Maya for 10 minutes. But anyway, um, and so I think that uh, asking me how to do it is a fascinating question because I can just tell you exactly what I did. So uh, YouTube has all the tutorials that you'll ever need. You need to start off with the donut tutorial, which is done by Blender Guru. I can give you a link or we can put a link down below where it takes you through the complete workflow to create a donut from scratch. And I think it's something that everybody should do because 3d is such a fascinating skill to have you can literally create footage for youtube with 3d it's like i want a shot of a cat reacting to this minecraft character then just make it in 3d it will take you when you're skilled enough it will take you an hour to make and there you have the perfect shot and people just like suck it in and so from there once i completed that tutorial i started to just look for stuff that i wanted to use in my videos you see i wasn't learning 3d just in sort of isolation i was learning it to use it in the video so every single time i did a video i would try to learn something new so i'd be like how do i make clouds how do i do a sky how do i make the sun look realistic how do i make an airport for the plane to sit at how do i put a guy standing in the cockpit pressing buttons and stuff like that and i would actually sit down and i would put time aside and go like Like, how do I learn animation? How do I learn texturing? How do I learn rigging? And there's still a lot for me to do. And so that's why every single video that I make, I'm really trying to make the 3D better and better. I want people who are watching this in a year's time to go to my channel today and then go to the videos a year ago and see a huge difference. And that's pretty uh, scary thought to have because I think the 3D is pretty good right now. (laughs) But if I'm saying a challenge to myself that in a year, I want it to look like a Pixar film. I want it to look like something that you would see in Hollywood. Like, why not? That's what it should be. And I'm going to teach myself to get there step by step. That's that's fantastic. I'm holding you to that. I hope you know. (laughs) I'll, I'll personally hold you to that. And I'm sure our viewers will as well. That's, that's sweet. So, well, no, that, that's a great guide. And I mean, I, I'm going to be honest, I, I don't really know much about that. And the way you explained it was perfect because now I can kind of understand, you know, the steps uh, that, that could take place. So then I, I know that you did mention that sometimes you bring in uh, renders. So what does that process look like? Is that, do you, do you get somebody that is more advanced? And then are you hoping that like next year you wanted to deal with that? Or how, how does that work? So I am actually looking and I have probably found the person that I uh, want to bring on board. So basically, as I was saying before, when we're talking about teams, it's all about surrounding yourself with better people. And and that can also be applied, of course, to the whole YouTube business side of things, which Mm -hmm. we can talk about it in a little bit. And basically, um, I found people who are like a guy who was like, I'm going to simulate ice coffee in blender in real time and you're just like what the hell is this is insane and they're like you know they're expensive and that's what i was trying to say that anytime i get an advertiser or something like that i'm putting it back into the channel and bringing these people on board people who do professional work in like hollywood and stuff like that who are 3d modelers and animators and they come on board and they go you're doing all this wrong and they're dramatically improving uh, the videos that I'm creating. And so a good example for that would be a few videos ago, I brought on board a new person who's very good at animating, but also animating a realistic camera. So now it looks like that all my videos are actually like, you know, 
the guy's trying to capture a ufo as it flies by with (laughs) with a video camera yeah and it's it's exciting because that's what i realized what was missing anybody could make a camera rotate around a box like it's it's not it's not a very complicated thing and it's something that i've been doing for years for my videos this new person has just brought in such a crazy new insight that everything can be dynamic and moving and scary, just like in Hollywood, like Marvel movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the thing that puts you to the edge of your seat. And so that's why I've been getting people to come in to do the sort of 3D animation to help me with that. And it is a big sort of expense, but I think it's something that will really improve the viewer's experience uh, in definitely in the coming years. Oh, definitely. Wow. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're just a really good boss slash manager, <laughs> visionary uh, in general. So, I mean, that's you should be really proud of yourself because the way you kind of dissect a problem is is really professional and really impressive. Now, in my research, I noticed you worked for Yahoo Plus 7. You actually did some photography and worked extensively in marketing before launching Found and Explained. What skill has been most valuable during your transition from marketing to becoming a full-time YouTuber? It's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I've had the most bizarre career. If you ever go look at LinkedIn, and I finally updated it so it actually makes sense, I've had the most crazy like jumping around career. I've worked in sort of television in the newsroom, and then I worked in sales. I worked for like products and fashion. And I was even the manager of a cinema chain in Australia for a little bit. So I got uh, pretty tight with the Disney and stuff like that (laughs) back in the day. And so basically, I would say the number one thing for me uh, with sort of my, I have a master's of marketing as well from university, how I've applied that is sort of believing that any problem is solvable and that anybody can talk to. I had the biggest problem talking to people, negotiating, or trying to get like a deal. And I'm like, you know, you talk to people and you go like, oh, I really want like X. And they're like, no, when people say no. And you just have to be like, okay, hold on. I I understand you're saying no, but how can we make this happen? Is there something else? And it was always this way of like talking to people and sort of negotiating to eventually get what you want or to come to a, I, I don't really believe in compromises. I just believe that everybody can win. I think that, you know, both sides can win. And that's led me to be incredibly confident when it comes to sort of making deals, working out sponsorships, and also working out um, with a team and becoming a manager. And I would say that, uh, yeah, I would say that's the, the main one. And then also sort of to touch on the marketing side of things, because I understand that that also has a huge impact, is that realizing that it's all about content that it's always about pushing out new content, finding new channels to push out the content. People want to connect with you on various different sort of social medias. That's why I have all the different social medias for my channel, even even TikTok as well, even though it's uh, it's definitely a little bit strange, this new uh, short form video content (laughs) channel. Um, And yeah, you've just got to reach out to where the audience is rather than trying to get the audience to come to you on a single platform. No, oh, that's that's great advice. That's good feedback. Because I know a lot of people that, you know, go to school for marketing or advertising, and then they're like, okay, now what do I do with that? Or, you know, what are the next steps that I need to take to apply it? Um, so no, that's 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 great perspective. Um, I did ask Damn it Jeff about sponsorships, and you mentioned sponsors a little bit, and obviously, you know, kind of what you were getting out just just before. But I wanted to ask you if you had any advice to give other creators on how to find and work with sponsors. Okay. Um, So first of all, big thing that I want you to take away from this, anybody who's watching, is that don't undercharge yourself. Believe in yourself. A lot of people that I read about, they'll get like a million views a video. And I'm talking to to you now, not not just to you, Zachary, um, (laughs) is that... Like they get a million views of video and they charge like a hundred bucks to Amazon. It's like Amazon's a billion dollar company. You are the prize. Like 
you're not like desperately trying to get a sponsorship. You have the audience, you have the thing that they want. So you should charge um, for that price. And if you're at that stage, I recommend that you come to uh, the community, perhaps the subreddit on um, uh, the partnered YouTube subreddit where you can ask those types of questions like how much to charge for a sponsor. But when it comes to actually finding a sponsor, the best way is to literally just email the brands that you want to work with. Say, I want to talk to your marketing team. I've got this channel. I've got this reach. Prepare maybe a little document or just a slide showing your demographics and say, I really want to work with you because they will love that. Because I've been on that side of the fence as a marketing manager. I would give free stuff away all the time. I would pay people to come and watch a movie at the cinema because we were that desperate for reach and exposure and to get content that we can show people. And so that's why I think if you want to work with a brand, you email them. So like find all, anytime you see a YouTuber that you follow having a, an, ad, an ad spot, email that ad. Just, just email them out of the blue because you never know. And I reckon that for every 10 that you email, you'll get one person and that person will end up sponsoring your channel. There are some brands out there that sponsor channels that get less than 10,000 views a video. Like they're that, they're that able to work with small YouTubers. So don't think that science is a problem. So just get out there and uh, just start hitting them up. Hit the streets. <laughs> awesome. No, that's a, another A plus answer. <laughs> Sweet. So, okay, I do have these two fun questions. I always ask, what is the biggest mistake that you've made in your YouTube career? And then what are you most proud of? Mm, in the whole career? Mm, okay. Yes. Um, well, I would probably say... I would probably say that one of my biggest mistakes that I have definitely made was not starting sooner. <laughs> I dabbled around YouTube for years. And if you actually Google my name, you'll find another channel that has all the appearances of being rather successful. Getting, I think it was something like 15 years ago, I made a video that got like 10,000 views. And it was like a short film that I made about a guy with telekinesis and really bad 3D. Like uh, this is that 3D project that I mentioned at university at the beginning of the video. And so like, I, and I saw it, I went, wow, it got 10,000 views. So anyway, and it was just like, I now look back and I realized that like, if you've started, just keep going. Like, just keep going because you never know where it's going to go. Like, this new channel, Found and Explained, I, I call it new, even though it's about two years old now. Mm -hmm. But you can see that it's two years old and it's got 250,000. Uh, and time is such an important thing on YouTube. You need your videos to be up for a certain amount of time for then you to get that momentum and growth. I think we all know examples of videos that kind of didn't really get going, didn't really explode for months even like a year or two. And so you need to be up there on YouTube to be successful. And I wish that I had done that back when I was like 18, 19, because I'm now 32 and having a YouTube channel, um, it's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. The, the best time if you haven't started in the past is now, but I wish I did start in the past. And then I would say, what, what was the other question? My what biggest are you strength? most proud of? Yeah. <laughs> most proud of, most proud of. I would probably say, I'm most proud of taking the, the leap and doing it myself. Like when I was working for that other channel, I could have stayed there. They were paying me money. They were putting food on the table and I'm immensely grateful for this other channel. But I decided to take that risk. I decided I had no other income at the time. I was willing to lose my job to try and have a channel. And I think that that is my most powerful moment. I had nothing and I threw it all away to get one subscriber. Like if you think about that, I threw away to get one view from one per random person on the internet. That's all I wanted. And I got so much more and I'm incredibly grateful for that. That's, that's amazing. That's the dream. I mean, that I think a lot of people can relate to that, taking that jump. I mean, that is such a proud moment, especially, you know, from a cozy dog, you know, a cozy job where you're getting paid, you know, to, to becoming, you know, your own boss and an entrepreneur. That's, that's awesome. So I guess, you know, you, you've hit a quarter of a million, 
you're doing fantastic. What are the future goals then for you and your channel? Well, that's such a fun, funny thing. I uh, always had, I always had a dream to reach a million subscribers, a complete egotistical fantasy, <laughs> mind you, but I've always, yeah, that, that's my next goal is that I want to reach a million subscribers just so I can go to my parents and say, I did it. Um, but that's uh, that aside, I would also really like to sort of branch out, perhaps do other things. As we mentioned before, the train video has gone completely nuts. So I would love to do other things in sort of that realm, maybe other railways or boats, or perhaps even start to just tell stories because that's what I'm about. I love telling stories. And I did a recent video about an encounter with a UFO that happened with the US Navy. And I told it through my 3D animations and people loved it. They said, this was a great story talking about these fighter jets, like trying to chase down a UFO. We want more of this. And so that's what I think I want to do. I want to do like other things apart from planes and tell more stories in the world of uh, with uh, 3D and then get better at 3D. So watch this space. <laughs> That's awesome. I 100% guarantee you will get to a million. And when you do, you can come back on here and you could tell us how you did it. <laughs> I would I would love that. That would be great. So to, to wrap it all up, if you were to give one piece of advice to a new creator who wants to create a YouTube channel in 2022, what would it be? Just keep going. Just keep going. It's like that, uh, what is it? Finding Dory, just keep swimming. <laughs> I know that things can look bleak. I know that you can release a video and it can flop. It can be 10 out of 10. And you can be like, my entire channel is dead. It's dying. Nobody wants to watch my content. But you're just one video away from having a viral hit. Like, uh, get out there, just keep making videos and you never know where you're going to end up. That's awesome. No, that's fantastic advice. I mean, I'm I'm gonna even I'm gonna live by that. <laughs> that sounds perfect. So that just about does it. Thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. But before you do go, do you have anything you want me to promote or tell the audience about that's going on this year or coming up? Oh, I would just say come and if you haven't watched my channel before, come over and become a subscriber at Fountain Explained so I can get that uh, million views. But also if you have any suggestions uh, to come over and list it down in the comments of any other ideas that I should do or um, sort of other things that I can do on Fountain Explained because I'm really looking for the, as I mentioned before with the teams about bringing new people on and getting fresh ideas because I feel like this channel can be much more than just me and I need, I need you to do that. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much again. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, we will see you guys next time. See you guys. Mm -hmm.